It's another Spike Studio production. It's a consultant in your pocket webcast. Join Marie Scott and Tom Duff as they talk all about Tivoli Directory Integrator or TDI from the developer perspective. This is the first in their series talking about TDI. Excuse the brief outage in the intro as we work through a recording problem with the webcast software, which has now been rectified. So I'm sorry you missed the first two minutes or so of this webcast. Otherwise, look for another one coming up soon inside of the series. Now, connectors are where you're going to spend a lot of your time when you're working in TDI because they set up your data source, they um, set up the authentication, they set up your ports, they set up a lot of the logging. They're actually where um, you can see the, the different data values, um, and they're very important, and Tom will show two or three types of these later on, but you're going to spend a lot of time in these, and there are so many different options that are included in a connector. Within a connector and your data sources are entries, and these are what I'd, we like to call the data buckets. These are the data objects, and each of the entries has attributes or the subparts of the entries. And the attributes are what describe the data values from the various data sources. So entries contain attributes, and attributes contain values. So we're going to, you know, this is something you'll see a lot of as well. So next slide. A couple other things that you'll see, you'll see references to work entries. And the work entry is the entry that's being manipulated in the assembly line, the connector Entry is the entry that's the local work store for each connector. And then, as I've referred to in the connector, the, the attribute map, which is part of the connector, is something that is, you'll see is really key in terms of understanding how your different um, data sources are going to map together when you try and bring data from one data source. For example, if you've got a SQL database and you've got um, uh, entries in your SQL database that you want to link to, say, um, entries in a Domino database, you're going to use that attribute map to link those two to um, each other. Next slide. Now, we, you know, talked about different ways to kind of, you know, make it easier to understand um, what's actually happening in an assembly line crisis. We came up with this diagram. And what we've got here is a graphical representation of what Tom is going to do with one of the examples. And it's to move a CSV file and a notes database um, and map them together in the assembly line. And he's got a data source, which is a notes database, and attributes, which are the fields on a notes form, which most of you are probably familiar with. And then he's got a CSV file, which is another data source. And each of the records in the CSV file um, are entries, and they have specific attributes. And they connect um, each with their own specific type of connector to the assembly line. And then the assembly line process, it's going to map the CSV entries to forms, um, the form fields, so that the fields in the notes database will be updated with the CSV information. Next slide. Now, you know, we've talked about TDI and that it's free, it's free, and we just wanted to make sure that everyone understood what this meant. Um, Domino license holders are entitled to use TDI, and um, it's available on the IBM Passport download site. And what's really important to um, to remember to do when you are installing TDI, and Tom's going to cover this later, is to also check IBM Fix Central for TDI fix packs. The entitlement, and I've got a link here that specifically describes it, um, should include Domino as a data source. That's what makes it free. If, you were, if TDI were a standalone product and you weren't connecting Domino to it, then you would have to um, purchase it as a standalone product. But IBM has packaged it with Domino. Next slide. And 
when you go to the Passport site, you'll see um, when you're going through the Domino software selections, you'll see that you've got options to, you know, if available, would you like to see the associated products available at no charge? And then on the next screen, you can actually pick those. And, you know, included in those, you'll see like Tivoli and DB2 and WebSphere. And this is where you would actually find the downloads for Tivoli. And the version that we're going to show today is version 7, but both 6.11 uh, and 7, um, both are still being supported. Okay, I'm going to turn it back over to Tom. <coughs> okay. So as Marie um, finished off there, you can go with TDI version 7, uh, or you can go with TDI version 6.1. We're going to cover 7. The user interface in 7 is much more, uh, much more clear, much easier to work with. So <clears throat> rather than teach you something that is on its you know, way out <laughs> and then have you download the latest and have it be completely different, we'll go with 7. I'll also mention the fact that there's a beta program right now for the next version of TDI. So what we're showing you here is definitely valid for what you will currently download, but coming up here in you know the next few months, I would think, probably by the end of the year, I would, I would believe, that you'll see uh, another version, updated version of TDI, which will have new and improved features. <clears throat> so when you're going ahead and downloading whatever the package name is on IBM's Partner World site, you go ahead and get it. In this case, when I downloaded for this screen print, the package number was C1IF0ML. I expanded out to the Windows x86 directory because I installed it on my desktop and I'm running Windows here, Windows 7. And then I went ahead and clicked on the install uh, TDIV 70 Win x86 executable. Now <clears throat> there is a launch pad application that you can use, I think it's one directory back, that theoretically installs it for you with all the whistles and bells. I found that that didn't work as well. So if you go directly into the executable as I have specified here, it seems to give you a better install result and it's a lot easier to follow the wizard. So <clears throat> when you first start your install, you'll have the option of registering the administration console as a system service. So if you're running this on a desktop like I'm doing, I don't want it starting as a service because I'm going to start and stop TDI at the points that I actually want to run it. But if I were actually installing this on a server and was going to use it in production, I'd probably select this option so that whenever the server came up, that service would be running, and then I could go ahead and have TDI going on a regular basis in my production environment. <clears throat> if you're installing and you had a prior version out there, you'll definitely get this message coming up saying it found an old version, you know, it'll overwrite, so on and so forth. I've also found regardless of whether I have the old in version installed or not, I tended to get this error. Um, I had everything cleaned up. I got the error, so if I'm not upgrading, I can ignore it. If I am upgrading, I would probably want to make sure that I had uh, any assembly lines that I wanted to save, any of my production jobs backed up so I could bring those back in at a future point in time and test them under the new, uh, the new setup. I choose my install directory, which I just went ahead and took the default running my Windows 7 platform. And then it tells you, or asks you basically, what features do you want to run? Once again, because I'm running locally, disk space is cheap, I'm going to go ahead and take everything. If I were running on a server, I would probably leave off like Java docs and examples and things like that. But in this case, just so I have everything available to me as I'm going through and doing work with this, I'm going to go ahead and select everything and let it install. <clears throat> now your solutions directory is where all your assembly lines are going to be stored. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and take a subdirectory named TDI, and what that will do is on my home directory in my Windows 7 uh, setup, it will have all the TDI assembly lines or the TDI projects that I set up. And you'll see when we start up, it'll give you the ability to say, do you want to use your home directory and the previous setup that you have uh, for where all your TDI assembly lines are, or do you want to specify another one? Uh, there can be times when you may want to have two or three if you're working on different projects for different client, things like that. Uh, 
Um, do you want to have an embedded console? You know, you can go ahead and select yes. It's not going to make a difference for when you're running local like we're doing here. I went ahead and took the default ports for HTTP and everything else. And then at that point, it'll give you the, here's everything you're going with. Do you want to go ahead and install it? You click OK. It runs for probably about, oh, I think five to ten minutes at most. And TDI is installed. So in terms of being able to go out and install it yourself and not having to spend you know two or three hours of your own free time trying to get an uh, instance of TDI set up so you can start playing with it, it is very straightforward. It is very easy to install. And so as a result, the, the barrier of entry to get in and start playing with TDI is actually very low. Um, if you can install a Domino server and notes client, you can very likely install TDI with no problems whatsoever. Uh, first time I start up here, I'm going to start the configuration <clears throat> editor just to make sure that I can get in. The configuration editor is what I'll be launching every time I go into TDI. Um, when I first launch it, it's going to ask me for the workspace. Uh, this is the workspace I referred to a couple slides back saying, do you want to go ahead and store your stuff out in this particular directory? I'm going to go ahead and use the default uh, because I just have a local setup here and I'm not working with multiple clients and consulting and stuff like that. I really don't care for it to ask me every time, is this the one you want? But I could separate out separate TDI workspaces. Once again, if I wanted to separate my work for different clients and stuff, this would be very easy to do at this point. And it's important to know where the workspaces are if, if you do decide to um, put them in different sections because when you install some of the connectors, it will ask you to install jar files in a specific workspace. So if you go with the default, that's good, but if you do separate it out, just keep that in mind. Thank you. <clears throat> and then... Once you start uh, Tivoli Directory Integrator for the first time, it'll come up to this screen, and if you get here, yes, you're connected, you have TDI up and running, congratulations, it really was that easy. Uh, once you go to the workbench, the workbench is the Eclipse uh, framework that you're going to see here. It should look very familiar if you're working with Domino 851 or if you've worked with any Eclipse projects before. And that's where you're going to spend all your time. That's where you're going to set up your projects, your assembly lines, everything else. And you won't see this screen every time you log on. You'll just go directly to the workbench. Now, <clears throat> when I first installed TDI, uh, I had it out there. And Marie, being the admin that she is, and me being the developer that I am, uh, I said, OK, I've got it up and running. She goes, OK, have you installed fixed packs? And I said, um, no. No, what he said was, fix pack? What's a fix pack? Okay, fine. It was, it was close. <laughs> but uh, I got educated very quickly on where Fix Central was at IBM, and uh, I really like this site now. <laughs> so the first thing you do after you install TDI is go out to Fix Central, look up the Tivoli Directory Integrator, look at what your installed version is. In this case, I had installed... Uh, version 7.0.0 and said, show me the fix packs. And at the point that I actually installed this one for the examples we had, we were at fix pack 2. Um, we're up at fix pack 4 now, Marie? Yes. Okay. So if you were to go out and do the same thing, either it would download fix pack 4 and you could look in the about TDI and find out exactly what the number is that you've downloaded. But and, there, go and, there, ahead. And, and excuse me, Tom, um, no, fix packs ahead. are cumulative. So if you're just starting with TDI and you go out and you're downloading TDI 7.0 and you want to go out and get the fix pack, you don't have to get fix pack 1 and then fix pack 2 and then fix pack 3 and fix pack 4. You can get just fix pack 4 and apply it, and it will um, apply the previous fixes for you. That's a very good point. I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, and also, if you have worked with TDI under 6.1, uh, 6.1 had a very nice fix pack installer. And you clicked a few things, and you went through a wizard, and it installed the fix pack. Unfortunately, TDI 7, uh, it's very much a command line driven process. So make sure you read the about document in terms of how to install your fix packs, because it is 
more complicated, more tedious under TDI 7 than it was under 6.1. 6, uh, but once again, you install the fix packs. I think when I installed fix packs, it ran for about 10 minutes or so. Uh, I had my black command line you know, screen up there and just said updating this, updating this, and there were like four things that updated and then it was done. So that was very easy. <clears throat> the only other manual step that you'll need to do to prepare your TDI environment for running Domino is you need to copy over the notes jar file into your TDI environment. So go ahead and connect to uh, your notes directory where you've got your uh, jar file stored. Pick up your notes jar file, just a copy, and then go out to your TDI directory under jars, third party, IBM, and paste your notes jar file in there. Uh, if you don't do this, you will know very quickly that something is wrong because anytime you try to connect to a Domino directory, you'll start throwing Java errors. And a number of the resources that we'll show you at the end where they have tutorials and things like that, this particular step right here is almost always covered in make sure you do this to go any further because if you don't do this, none of your Domino examples are going to work. Henceforth, uh, TDI with having Domino at one end or the other end to be free is irrelevant because TDI with Domino isn't going to run without this. So this is a very important step to keep in mind. And it's really not specified anywhere uh, during the install. You just have to remember to do it or you see it during your, uh, during your tutorials that you're working through. <clears throat> now the examples. I could have done this live. Unfortunately, I was afraid with the latency of trying to do this uh, online and pushing the changes that we'd get very sporadic screen prints and you'd miss things. So I am just going to do screen prints here. I do apologize for people who want to see real life code being done at the time, but we do have all the steps very well screen printed and I believe, uh, if I remember correctly, we will have the PDF file available for you afterwards. So you can download this and really walk yourself through it. So um, even though you're not getting a live demo here, you will get something that you can take away that you can then go back and, and work with yourself. So in our first scenario, <clears throat> we're going to take a C, uh, CSV file, comma separated values, and move it into notes. And the reason that you might want to do this over, say, you know, just doing a straight import from your notes client or uh, some sort of a <clears throat> agent that you set up is imagine that this was all running on the server and you wanted this to be triggered by the appearance of a file on a server in an FTP directory or you wanted to schedule this to run every hour or something like that. TDI can use those as triggers to execute so you could go ahead and use TDI in this environment in this scenario to run these things automatically. Yes, you could do it with some sort of a, a Lotus script agent but if you've got TDI running and you've got TDI working with other things, uh, TDI can be a much more uh, solid situation and you can easily set up new jobs to run without having to code any additional agents that are going to be running the back end. So what we've got here, very simple file. Uh, I used my book review database, which for anybody that follows my blog, you'll know that I review and read a few books each year. <coughs> and then I went ahead and separated out that data into a CSV file. So on your left you'll see that I've got book title, book author, book publish date, and my book rating. On the right hand side you'll see that I've got my notes database which in this particular case was completely empty. So the first thing I do is I create a project for our job. And project is really just the overall container it's going to have your assembly lines, your references, your resources, everything else for that particular set of uh, steps and set of a, a set of assembly lines that will make up the task that we're trying to accomplish. So it's very easy, new project, call it whatever it is, give it your default location, and it will go ahead then and appear in your navigator tab. In this case, I called it TDI book list project. The next thing I do is I create the actual assembly line. And the assembly line is what is going to run to take my input connector, my output connector, <coughs> and then do the process in the middle that will map attributes. And I always want to say fields, and Marie always corrects me. It's 
they're not fields, they're attributes. They're attributes. <laughs> they're attributes. Um, so it'll take your attributes from your input side, which is our CSV file, and put them out to the Nodes database on the output side. So I go ahead, create the assembly line. I'm just going to call it TDI assembly line, nothing fancy there, and I'm good to go. I have my assembly line core created. <clears throat> now the first thing I need to do is I need to build my feed connector. And my feed connector is what is coming in to this assembly line. That's going to be my CSV file. So with what you see over on the left-hand side of the graphic, you'll see TDI assembly line and the add component button. I click that and I get a list of all the components that I can choose from. Now I want to choose connectors, so I go ahead and select connector there, which narrows down the number of components I see. And because I'm using a CSV file, I'm going to use a file system connector. It's one of, as you saw in the graphic earlier, you know, dozens of connectors I can choose. In this case, file system connector, and I'm going to choose a mode of iterator. The iterator mode just says I'm going to start at the beginning. I'm just going to iterate through all the records. So I choose that. I go ahead and configure the connector by saying, here's where you can find my file. There are some additional uh, parameters that you can use, but by and large, just specifying the file path of work and find the CSV file is all you need to do to get started. <clears throat> then once I have my and connector... Can we, go, can we go back one slide? Oh, sure. Go ahead. And where, um, you know, as I mentioned with connectors that you can do a lot of things, um, if you notice in this particular slide that you have the ability to do detailed logging, if you get into a situation where you're having some issues with your connector, the detailed log option is really good for troubleshooting, so just keep that in the back of your mind. Um, additionally, the detailed log can help you with um, logging your process once it's running. So if you need to keep logs of an assembly line, the detailed log can help you build those. And, and that's one additional thing that's good about TDI, and Tom referenced it, you know, TDI versus writing your own script. I mean, TDI will do logging for you, and you don't have to build that um, as a separate process for like a Lotus script or anything like that. Um, TDI has built-in logs, so if you need to keep track of a process, it'll do that for you. So, Very good point. Thanks. You. <clears throat> of course, you know, as developers, we're not going to have any errors in our processes, so we don't Right, really and you don't care about, about logs either. It doesn't, it doesn't affect my life. <laughs> it's only you admin type that want to know about logs. Right. <clears throat> so uh, once I have my uh, once I have my connector uh, configured, then what I'm going to do is select my parser. And the parser actually hooks in with the connector to say, what am I going to do with this data in terms of splitting it up and parsing it so I know how to read it and what kind of um, what kind of attributes I'm going to see in what type of order, how are they going to be split up record-wise, so on and so forth. Fortunately, there's a CSV parser. How convenient. So I'm going to go ahead and choose the CSV parser for this connector. Now, <clears throat> the field separator that it came with as a default was the semicolon. If we were to go back and look at the file that I had shown on the screen, my separator was actually a true comma, so I just go ahead and change my field separator here. And that's really all I need to do to configure. Once again, you do have the detailed log if you're into detailed logs, <laughs> but it, it looks much the same as the connector configuration. Once again, it really is that easy. And at that point, you have your feed connector configured. Uh, it's set up, it's using the file system connector, it's going to iterate through, you've got your parser defined, and that's set and ready to go. So that's one step. One thing that TDI does that is really cool that I like for the file system connector is if you go over to the right-hand side of the screen, you'll see a connect and an X button. So what you can do is now that you have the file uh, defined and it can find it, you can click connect, it will actually go out there and try to find the file, and if it does, if you see down at the bottom of the screen where you have the logging, it'll say, oh, I found it, I'm going to go ahead and use the first input line for my column names, so I already know what my attributes are going to be named, and it's going to list those <coughs> on the right-hand side of the screen, 
And every time I click Next, it's going to iterate to the next record and show me what the values are for those attributes. You don't know how hard that was for me to get that out there, Marie. I want yeah, to say I do. Field I, I have. <laughs> <laughs> they're fields. And, and, they're values. What can I say? Right. And this is this is what I referred to earlier as the attribute mapping area. This is what's really um, where you can really take a look at, like Tom said, the data. And um, as you see here on the screen, we've got right across on the left side where it says work, attribute, and assignment. This is where you can really get into some powerful configuration and linkage here. And we'll show a little bit more <clears throat> in a couple slides about how you can go beyond just this field maps to this field or this attributes maps to that attribute, that you can actually do data transformation in the process. So now that we have the input side set up, we're going to go to the output side, which is the data flow connector. So once again, very similar, I add the component, select connectors, I'm going to take the Lotus Notes connector and I'm going to set it up in the mode of add only. And so as it's getting input, it's going to be adding that data into whatever Lotus Notes database that I configure in my connector here. In this particular case, since I'm running locally, I'm going to define a local client type session, use the password of my Notes ID file, and I will select what database that I'm actually writing to. Once again, it's on my local machine, so those are the kind of, um, those are the kind of fields that I will go ahead and set up. And that's really all I need to do on the Notes side. Now, unfortunately, well, actually, if you look at the very bottom, <clears throat> you'll see that it uh, opened a session to the Domino server, which is local in this case, and it was able to connect. So at this point, I know that my connector is working on the data flow side or on the output side. And I'm going to be able to get that connection when I'm running the assembly line. So I know that everything's set up pretty well. Um, when I go to the next example that I do, you'll see that, unfortunately, if I'm trying to iterate through Notes database, I can't use the connect and next and things like that because the connector really isn't set up to iterate through and show you the data in the Notes database. But if you're just looking at the information down in the console area, you'll see that we did get a connection in TDI to the actual uh, Domino environment, which in this case is the insurance client. Now here's the attribute mapping <clears throat> that we're going to be working with. So I'll go back to my, um, my file connector. I'm going to click the Add button for mapping. And being that it knows what my four attribute names are, book author, book publish date, book rating, book title, it's going to list all those and say, which ones are you going to want to work with? I'm just going to do Select All and OK because I want to move over all four of my fields. And then you'll see in my input map of what my attributes are, you'll see where it's got all four of those listed. So I've actually defined and mapped my four attributes coming in. Then on the data flow side, which is my output side, I click Map. It says, OK, what are my four attributes going out? I'm going to go ahead and select all four again because, once again, I want to go ahead and copy over all four of my data items from the CSV into my notes database. So I go ahead and select all those. And you'll see where the assignment goes one for one across. And I'm ready to go now. Now, granted, explaining that seems to take a lot of time, but once you're used to TDI, uh, that whole process there probably would have taken me about two or three minutes. It's truly that quick. So I'll go ahead and run this, uh, which if you look at the TDI assembly line that I have set up, you'll see your run option up there. And if you look at the console when it runs, you'll see that the parser is going to use my first line for column names, open the domino session, iterates through, prints the connector statistics. So I had 87 documents coming in, added 87 documents going out, finished the connector, and really in less than two seconds, I had a transfer that took place. And if I had this scheduled or if I had this triggered on the server side, you know, this would be happening automatically for me. It would be quick and, you know, TDI would be taking care of all this for me. So that's one example. Here's a look at the notes output file that I, or the notes uh, database that I have after I ran it. You'll see that everything is showing up in the view. Uh, if I was showing you live, I'd show you that there are actually 87 documents out there. 
but it's it's really that simple to get going with TDI in terms of wanting to bring things from some sort of data source into a notes database. Very quick, very easy. Now the second example <clears throat> that we're going to do is I'm going to take that notes data that I have and it'll be the same notes data I just brought in and I'm going to put that out to an XML file. Uh, that would be a little bit more challenging to do if I were trying to set up my own notes uh, agent to do that, uh, especially when you compare it to how TDI is going to do this and the transformations involved. So I think this is where you'll see where TDI really starts to pick up some ease of use and um, some maintainability that would be a little bit more difficult if you're trying to write your own agents. So again, same database that you saw in the first example. Uh, I'm going to create the project and create the assembly line. I won't show you those again because it's exactly what I did the first time. I'll go ahead and set up my feed component, which is my input, and I'm going to head and I'm going to go ahead and select Lotus Notes connector again as my feed or my input going this time, and I'll select iterator mode, which means I'm going to start at the top of the data that's in my notes database, and I'm just going to iterate through all the documents that I have out there. Same concept that I did with uh, the CSV file, only this time I'm doing it with Domino. And once I uh, got it out there, once I did the configuration of the notes connector like I did before, putting the local client, the password, and the database that I'm going to be pulling from, I could look at the bottom and I would see that I've once again established a connection to the Domino database, so I know that that's taken care of and that at least I can reach it. And this is where I'm talking about the fact that I would like to be able to click connect and iterate through the notes database so I can see what documents are out there, but the notes connector doesn't support that. So I know that I've got the connection, but I can't actually go through and see the data, unfortunately, at this stage of the game. Now, in terms of how I have to do my mapping here, because it can't go through and iterate and find all the file names that I want from the notes connector side, I have to manually key in the field names or the attribute names that I'm going to deal with in notes. So I'm going to show my mapping. In this case, I'm not going to see that I have any attributes out there. So I have to enter my new name. In this case, I would need to know the field names of the four databases or the four uh, fields in my notes document that I'm actually going to be using. So in this case, book title, I click OK. I would then do that same thing for book author, book publish date, and book rating. And when I'm done adding those four, you'll see that it looks very similar to what I had before on my CSV side coming in. Uh, only in this particular case, I'm doing it on the notes side and I have to manually enter it. Now to configure the data flow, which is going to be our XML file going out, same type of thing as before, add the component, select my connector, it's a file system connector because I'm writing out to the file system of the computer that I'm working on, and I'll select add only. Much like I did with notes, I'm just going to be adding to the, the data, or adding to the file that's already out there. File system connector, I go ahead and specify what the file is and where it's at. And for terms of parser, as in how it's going to write the data to the file system, I'm going to choose the XML parser. Uh, once again, it's really nice that TBI has all these parsers built in for you, so you don't have to code any of it manually. And as Marie referenced earlier, if you've got some weird thing that TDI has not been you know, configured for before, that parsers or connectors don't exist, you can always write your own. But there's a really wide variety, so I would say that probably 95% of the situations you're going to run into, you're going to find what you need already out there. On the XML parser, <clears throat> I could go through and start talking about you know, what I want my entry tags to be, the values, you know, all those kind of things. I could take detail logging, but just for the sake of this example so you can see how it runs, I'm just going to take the straight default that you see here. Very simple, the screen comes up, I click Finish, and then it says what attributes do I want to work with based on the attributes I had defined coming in from the notes side. Because I want to go ahead and map one for one going across book author to book author, I'm going to select all of them, click OK. But this is where things are going to change a little bit for this example. 
because I don't want to take the data as is, I'm going to want to modify the data coming out. I'm going to want to do some data transformation. And that's where uh, a lot of the power of TDI can come into play in the fact that I can use JavaScript, you know, simple scripting language, to go ahead and do my data transformations. So when I go into my uh, mapping and I say I'm going to take my book author that I had in my notes side and I'm going to write it out to the connector using book author, instead of doing that I can go ahead and click that and then I can enter as you see down here towards the bottom part of the screen, I can use JavaScript to go ahead and actually do data transformation. So in this particular piece of JavaScript that I have here, I'm looking for a comma within my author name because when I enter an author name within my database, I usually use uh, last comma first. But sometimes you may have a corporation that writes a book or some group entity where there is no comma. The XML requirements that I have from whatever you know company I was working with that I need to write this out for, they wanted first and last name format. And if there was no comma, I just would assume that it was a group entity and I wouldn't change the name at all. So with this little piece of JavaScript code here, I've now allowed my XML file to show something different value-wise than what was in my notes database. And I didn't have to write any code on the notes side or do any uh, weird stuff to the XML file once I got it created to get that done. I was able to do that transformation with JavaScript within TDI itself. One other transformation I chose to make is book rating. On the notes side, I just used a value of 1 through 5 but the requirements that I had on the XML side said I had to use some sort of a uh, text-based rating. So a 1 I just said sucks, 2 is poor, 3 is average, 4 is very good, and 5 is excellent. And if I didn't have a rating in there for some reason, I was just going to put the word unknown in. So once again, simple switch statement within JavaScript enabled me to get the transformation that I wanted within TDI going from notes to the XML output file. And at that point, I would save my configuration changes. I would run the job um, very quickly this time, less than a second. <laughs> uh, it actually went out, <coughs> iterated through the notes database, wrote my XML file, did all my data transformation. And if we look at the XML file that came out, you'll see that you know, Brown, Dan went to Dan Brown. And under book rating, I now have text values under there. And you know, this should look like a very normal XML file to you. For doc root, I could have actually had you know, book reviews if I had used uh, the configuration in there to change it. Entry could have been book review. And then I probably would have kept my attribute names as I have them here. Uh, but TDI, I could have done that with TDI too had I set up my XML file uh, configuration-wise properly or chosen to do it that way. Other possible scenarios, <clears throat> um, you could connect to an SQL database uh, for relational data uh, information, and you could write it to a Domino web page or a Domino database scheduled or triggered event. Uh, this could be nice if you have some web application that you want to say, I'm going to store all my data in a back-end SQL database, but you know, on a trigger of somebody making a request for some information, I want TDI to go get that information and bring it forward so I can display it on the web page. Uh, or I could do it in a batch mode. Uh, this right here would actually replace, in our environment, a relatively expensive tool that we get from a third party that pulls from a SQL database to pull in employee information that then gets written to a notes database that we use for other notes databases that flow through the system. In this case, I have a free tool, TDI, that would replace the annual licensing costs that we use for this other tool, and that's really all we use it for. Um, I could go notes database to notes database. And once again, this would be um, a one-time event. It could be a scheduled event. Whatever happens to work in your situation, but TDI would be very good for that. <clears throat> and ERP systems. Seems like everybody's got an ERP system of some sort. Um, PeopleSoft, Lawson, you may have SAP out there. 
you could connect TDI to the different tables that you need or the different connectors that actually connect in natively to those, um, those particular applications. Pull your data from there. Another one that Marie came up with this morning that was very interesting is say that you want to go ahead and um, take your DOM log files and maybe <clears throat> using some sort of filtering you want to iterate through your DOM log files and pull out data into a notes database that formats certain occurrences that you find in DOM log that you need to follow up on. Uh, TDI would be very good for that in the notes database to notes database or file system if you're writing DOM log to an uh, actual file out on your server somewhere. Um, you could use that to iterate through and get your data. So TDI's got endless possibilities. All you need to remember is to get the free aspect of it, that you need to have Domino either on the input side or the output side. And you can chain assembly lines together where maybe you start from going, but let's say in this particular case I have here, I have my CSV file, I had to get that CSV file to XML. Maybe I would have chosen to go CSV to Notes Database, Notes Database to XML. And in that particular situation, I could use TDI because I have Domino involved in that mix. Or if I had tried to go uh, CSV directly to XML, I would have left Domino out of the mix and I would have lost my entitlement at that point. So um, that's just another scenario of how you could run with it. And Marie, do you want to run with the resources screen here? Okay. Um, we've included a slide with lots and lots of good resources. Um, the one of my favorites is the Tivoli Directory Integrator Users Group. There are actually tutorials and the actual XML files that you can import into TDI um, to use um, to walk through the tutorials that are available. Um, as we mentioned before, um, Eddie Hartman, who's one of the TDI um, IBMers, um, he has put a lot of information together on the TDI users.org um, site. Additionally, if you're looking for some Domino specific information, you can find it on the site's google.com site Domino integration um, website that Eddie has also built. Tom and I also have been posting a series of articles um, on my blog, um, on TDI, and we're going to um, start up a number of articles on those as well um, that we've kind of had on the back burner. But um, if you do a search on TDI, you'll find that there's a lot of information on the web. If you're looking for something specific and you can't find it, contact us and, or contact Eddie directly. He likes to um, help people get started with TDI. I mean, he's a great resource. <laughs> he loves TDI. Yeah. <laughs> okay, next slide. Um, and as Chris mentioned, we're going to do another session um, it's scheduled for May 19th. Um, and when we talk about, you know, that this was from a developer's perspective and that the one on the 19th is going to be from an administrator's perspective, I mean, what we're primarily going to talk about is directories um, and how to take data from, say, LDAP and um, Active Directory and the Domino Directory and um, use those techniques and connectors to manage users, update um, user data, and we'll talk about some other um, options like password synchronization and using it for single sign-on and some things like that. So if you probably going to detailed on, logs too, right? Right. Um, of course. <laughs> um, we'll probably and in that particular assembly line that we'll build, then we're, we'll show you some logic. So if you want to learn about how to build some logic into um, your assembly line, that would be a good session to um, attend as well. And next slide. Okay, this is where if you've got questions or comments, we've got a little bit of time left. Yep, you guys do in the chats. I've sent them over to you. You see them under your questions. You have uh, quite a few, actually, that came through. Okay, so if I expand out <coughs> my questions here and then expand out the box, so we have a question from Kurt Stone. Security rights to connect from Tivoli server to file system server? 
I would assume that would be you know security within your system in turn I mean it, well, when you're, when yeah, you're go, setting, go ahead, Marie. Yeah, when you're setting up your connectors to any of the systems, it, the security that you need will depend on what you're doing. So, for example, if you're connecting to a nodes database and all you're going to do is run an iterator mode or read only mode, then you only need read access. If you're going to then connect to um, the Tivoli Access Manager and you're going to actually be writing records, then you're going to need um, to access it with some kind of um, ID that has right access. So that's, that's what you're going to kind of need to factor in when you set up your connectors. What ID do um, I need and what kind of access do I need to complete the process? Okay. Um, next question. Can you use TBI to connect the Domino directory to an MS Active directory to push information from Domino to AD? Sign up for the next session. <laughs> yes, yeah, the answer is yes. Yes, you can. That's that's where Marie, you know, really shines. Uh, we did we did actually a two hour session at Lotus Sphere on this, and part of it was why would we use it from a developer standpoint, which is what we did today. <clears throat> and then she did, you know, some really cool stuff with about fourteen virtual machine desktops and her Mac and the whole bit uh, about how she... They weren't that many, but <laughs> what, we, what, we, what we set up was um, I had an Active Directory VM and then I had a Domino VM and I was able to create an Active Directory account and then have it create a, a Domino account um, automatically because there are change detectors um, that um, are part of the connector set that will detect a change in Active Directory so you can push out um, and create an account and, and Domino. So you can also take it from the other way in that if I change a telephone number in the Domino Directory, I can have it push that change automatically to Active Directory. So yeah, it simply will, uh, it's definitely something that you want to keep in your toolbox for um, Domino and Active Directory, or LDAP, if you've got an LDAP system, say, for example, eDirectory or IBM Directory Services. Yeah, so Colleen, you definitely want to be at the next session uh, that we have listed on the prior, uh, the prior screen, because Marie will go to town on that one. Uh, Chuck, why is this better than writing an agent on the Domino side? <clears throat> Once again, in, in some cases, you may find if you've got some pushback in your organization for using Tivoli Directory Integrator or the fact that they don't want to install a new piece of software, why do we need to do this? In many cases, you can do the same thing with an agent. Um, but once you get beyond, say, I'm just writing from database to database um, or from database to a simple CSV or CSV coming in, uh, TDI starts to allow you to do a lot of things in a controlled environment, and as Marie said, there is a lot of logging that you can do. There's triggered events that you may not be able to do on the Domino side. You know, with Domino, you can say, well, run this agent every five minutes to go check, but then your admins get all upset with you because you're running agents every five minutes. Maybe you just want this thing to be triggered whenever something occurs that Tivoli can go see, such as maybe a, you know an AD entry gets created and then you want to bring something down to a different Domino database which isn't directory driven, you know, those triggers can fire um, where if you were trying to do it with the Lotus Script agent, you might not be able to do it as easy or it would be much more complicated. So, Or, or if you're like me where I'm, my primary hat is an administrator and I do happen to dabble in, in Domino development, but um, I'd rather write, you know, at formula language than a script, and so um, TDI allows me to just kind of set up some processes that I can do one time, and then if I've got an assembly line, I can just kind of reuse it. So um, I've been using TDI since 2005, and we have a couple of assembly lines that I wrote then that I haven't had to modify since 2005. So sure, you can do it with script, and if you've got the resources in-house, um, you know, the developers that can write scripts, then that's great. But if you don't and you need something that can move data around, that's what TDI is a good um, 
solution for. Okay. Uh, Colleen, looking to push phone numbers and employee information. Uh, once again, if you're looking to do that from the Domino directory side, which was your prior question, definitely on the next um, next webinar we'll do this. Um, but in terms of wanting to do that, say you've got the information stored in a SQL database. In our particular environment that I work in, and Marie and I do work in different locations, it's a situation where we have a lot of that information stored in um, a Lawson environment. But we need to bring it out to where we can have a domino phone directory. And so on a nightly basis, we can use TVI to go and say, okay, iterate through the SQL database that we have out there uh, or a view that we have out there of all that information and bring it down into Domino. And then at that point, we have Domino agents that actually go database to database because we've had those for the last 10 or 15 years. I could actually set up TDI um, assembly lines to go through on each of the specific Domino databases that need this information and pull and synchronize from that SQL uh, statement view that we have out there. So either one would work. Again, there's usually four or five different ways to solve a problem, uh, but TDI is really good for being able to pull down that information. Uh, Greg, do we have same time on the brain? Yes, we always have same time on the brain because we're writing the same time user's guide. <laughs> I don't know if that's what you meant, but you know, if you have another question, follow up on that. But yeah, Marie and I are writing a same time user's guide that hopefully will be published by the end of the year in an actual book. <clears throat> um, and then one other question out there from Chuck, maybe this is for the next webinar, but where does TDI live in the IT organization? Who owns, controls it? The Domino folks, the ETL folks, uh, somebody else. How do you share responsibility for assembly line project development and roll them up to be deployed by some central group? Um, I think that kind of depends on your own environment. Um, because Domino is in involved, um, my staff and I monitor it. Um, it. It just depends on your, your comfort level. But again, you could actually run the assembly lines on your workspace. I mean, you don't have to, and run TDI locally. You don't have to run it on a server. So it just depends on what um, type of project environment you're in and, and how people feel about change management. Um, if, you're, if you're going to be doing something like using TDI to uh, create accounts and update um, personal information and databases, um, you're going to want to have um, you know, the logging and change management, and you're going to want to have it on the server and um, because it is a production environment. So that's kind of what you have to work with and make sure that the, the user IDs that you set up in the connectors have the appropriate authority to um, connect to the database um, and data flow sources. But it doesn't have to be, um, say, a Windows server group that that runs it or your um, other operating systems people that run it or development, other development group other than the Domino development group. It, it's just going to be what your um, comfort level is. Sometimes what I found in talking to TDI, once they hear um, Domino, they're just as happy to turn it over to the Domino people to run. So Yeah, I, I think that is a very um, is a very true statement. In my environment, were we using TDI for other things that were not Domino related, I would probably be a <coughs> user of TDI, in which case I would have to work with the owner of TDI to say, okay, I've got this assembly line. I would think that they probably have um, a test environment set up there to where I can take these assembly lines, I can export and import them, so once I got them working in a test environment, I could bring them into production, there would be more of a change control process, where if Domino was the driving factor of getting TDI into our organization, given the, you know, do more with less, I have no doubt that probably we would get a situation where they'd say, oh, this is a Domino tool, then I guess it's yours, and I would control it all. So. 
And that's all the questions I see yeah. out there, Chris. Do we Marie, have any other ones? Yeah, Marie has some in her queue. Um, and then there was one at the very beginning. I don't know if I sent it over to you guys, but um, uh, actually I think you got that one. I yeah, see. Marie, one Can we push pull directory changes between Domino and RackF? Probably goes um, to your slide where you had all the sources on there. Yeah. Um, if there's a connector for it, then yeah, that's a possibility. Have I'm going back real that? quick to yeah. that other slide. Yeah, Tom will grab that slide. Have either of you done any? any I haven't done anything specifically with RACF, but, but the key there would be, um, if I recall, um, in terms of RACF, you'd have to have, uh, if you set up a connector, it, you'd have to have the appropriate authority and um, be able to delve into um, the different layers within RACF. Uh, I see RAC. There's RAC connector on the upper right-hand side. Yeah, well, there's a RAC connector on there. Yeah. And you can always write your own, so. <laughs> That, well, there's a ZOS TSO um, command line. Um, I'm not sure whether or not, or whether or not, there's also an SNMP connector, and whether or not any kind of RACF triggers would, um, if you could use anything like that to pick up any kind of alerts um, from SNMP. It depends on what you're trying to do, um, but again, if, if you've got a, a, a particular need for this, um, shoot an email to Eddie Hartman, and if they don't have a connector, um, they'll take a look at um, developing one or give you some suggestions on how to put together some connectors in an assembly line to um, set up something. Do right. you have another one in there? Um, I think I had another one for you. I think that's all. Oh. Um, I think there was one more. Was there? Yeah. Can we push pull? Let's see. I'm having trouble seeing it. Here's one that said, "Is it? Yeah, that I, uh, on my screen it shrunk up all of a sudden." There's one that says, "Is there any place where people can share useful assembly line configs with other users to modify?" Um, that check out uh, the the tdiusers.org um, site, because um, I know Eddie has a number of them out there. I don't think there's like um, a blog site or anything where people have posted um, their own, but um, check the tdiusers.org. And also that Google the group is probably a good one, isn't it? That user yeah. forum? Yeah. Yeah. There's also about a I don't know who got this one. What platform can it be installed on? Windows, iSeries, Linux, AIX? Any of those. I was going to say, I think the answer is yes. Yeah, <laughs> any of those. And then uh, I know one came in and said, can TDI replace LEI? Um, yeah, we actually talked about that in our <clears throat> room, and we made all the IBM people leave when we said that. <laughs> that and the answer is there's a lot of duplication there. So, um, provided there's not any IBM people on this line, you may find that free is a much better price than what you pay for LEI. <laughs> and then um, someone, someone asked who is Eddie Hartman, by the way, like, how do they find this guy? Eddie um, Hartman's over in Norway. Yeah. Uh, but he he's extremely accessible via email, uh, the email that you have there at the bottom of the screen. Oh, there he's bent over backwards to get us information for these TDI sessions, the TDI blog entries. He's pulled Marie in with a number of his staff for you know problems that she's had configuring something and they're right on top of it. Probably one of the best support groups I have ever seen within IBM in terms of being accessible, loving the technology that they work with and being really excited to be able to get people using TDI in this domino environment. Um, so yeah, definitely email him. He is very responsive. There's, there's one more. I think it's for the next one. And this is probably our last one. It says maybe, it actually says maybe this is for the next webinar. Where does TDI live in the IT organization? Like who owns and controls it? The domino folks, the ETL folks, or you know, how do you... Actually, we it? talked about that one. Yeah. 
cover that one. That was the last yeah. one before Marie took over her questions. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think I see. I see one that says, "Could you talk about the best practice where yep. to install TDI standalone server, Domino server?" Um, again, that's kind of your preference. Um, where I run it um, personally is when I'm doing um, development. Um, I run it locally, and then I have um, a Domino server that I kind of use as a utility server for other things, and I have um, a TDI install on the dom on that Domino server. So um, that's that's kind of a good model. Um, if but again, you, you just want to make sure that um, you do uh, set up a test environment and a production environment, and then in your test environment, you are working with test data because. You'll see once you get into the um, assembly lines and the connectors that the TDI, especially in update mode, is very, very powerful. And you can go in there and you can update stuff. And if you're not prepared to update things the way you want to, then things can really kind of get out of control. So, and it's yeah, very fast. So you may find that you updated everything before you even knew what happened. Right. <laughs> Right, so you've just updated, you know, 10,000 records and, you know, and uh, what did I just do? So, again, make sure that you work in a test and a production environment. Um, so, I, that would be my best practice recommendation. Excellent. Well, let me grab this real quick. Um, so, if anyone, um, Tom, I'm going to change your screen real quick. The guess. slides, as always, for the attendees will be mailed out, so there's no problem there. You guys will actually have that. Um, the slides will be mailed out to you as a PDF and available. Otherwise, look for them on May 19th, doing the admin perspective, which uh, I know that a few people on here will also be attendants for, and hopefully you guys get the administrators in your organization to also attend. TDI is a powerful tool, and these two have done a terrific job of dissecting it all. Uh, if they have other stuff, as you saw, their addresses are there on the slides, and or you can send them in, and I'll forward them along as needed. Otherwise. That concludes another one. We are right on time. And you two, thank you very much. That was awesome. Thank you for all the attendees. We appreciate it. Yeah, uh, they, thanks. They, they, they're still hanging in there. That's the good thing. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know, if you have any questions, be sure to reach out to us, um, Tom or I, and, and as Chris said, if you um, want to send, direct anything to him. But also, um, definitely reach out to Eddie Hartman. Um, his address is included in the slide. He loves TBI. Um, so. And he didn't get affected by the volcano because he was already there. So, right. excellent! You guys are getting a bunch of great jobs there in the uh, in the chat stuff. So, in the great, questions. great. All right, Thanks everybody. Thank you very much. It's another one. We're on time, and we will talk to you uh, here shortly for the next webinar. Okay. All right. Thank you.